Last week, we talked about what it means to follow Jesus. The Cliff Notes version, do what he says. This week, we move on to the next part. It's really simple, and it's all about Jesus. Welcome to Run With Horses. My name is Norman, and my goal is to help you thrive as a follower of Jesus. The spiritual life is both incredibly simple and potentially the most difficult part of your life. God invites you to live intentionally and on His mission. It's very cool that God allows us to do this together. Well, we're still working on what it might look like to live out my working definition of the church by going through, a word at a time, this simple definition. Today, we're looking at Jesus. So, as a reminder, my working definition of the church is, a church is a group of followers of Jesus who worship Him in spirit and truth, humbly offering their lives as living sacrifices, together living out the mission of Jesus as His witnesses to the world by sharing the gospel and making disciples through teaching obedience to His commands as they edify and equip others to join them on His mission. And as a quick reminder, what we're really looking at or what I'm looking for is the essential definition of the church, the minimal definition of the church, the one that we build on that will work in every culture, in every era, uh, in every age, in every language, that if we want to see new churches, this is the seed. We, we all agree on this is the church, and how that's expressed, how that is developed, will be different. But the seed, the minimum, the starting point is what we're looking for. And I understand there's a lot of um, things when we study ecclesiology that are not in this definition, and eventually we're going to come back and touch on those. I know a lot of people would look at this definition and say, well, it, it says nothing about deacons, about pastors. Uh, and you're right, it doesn't. Uh, and we're going to come to that and maybe delve more into it, and maybe it should include one or both of those. And that's part of my question, and if you have thoughts on that, I certainly would like to hear them. But the reason I didn't put them in there is because I asked the question, if you remember, what can you take out of what you currently have, and you would still consider what you have the church? Or what's the minimum? When you start with nothing, when you add this, 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 and this, what's the minimum where you you say, okay, now we have a church. And here's why I didn't put pastor or deacon in this minimal definition. I know a lot of churches that don't have pastors. <laughs> well, are they not a church if they don't have a pastor for a year? I know a church that's been without a pastor for 10 years. So does that mean that that group of people is not a church because they don't have a pastor? So if you'd say, no, it's still a church, but, okay, well, the but aside, it's a church, which means the minimal definition cannot say that they have to have a pastor to be a church. Otherwise, we'd have to say they're not a church, they're something else. Same with deacons. I know churches that haven't had deacons for years. Um, so in both cases... Do I think they're important? Absolutely. Do I think we want to work toward having those in every church? Yes. But when I started looking at this definition, I realized that I can't put that in my essential ecclesiology. It, to call this a church, it can't have to have a pastor. Otherwise, we're going to have to rethink the way we consider the work uh, of the pastor in the church. And I would say it, it would put greater uh, impact. Uh, it, it's going to make us look differently at a situation where a pastor leaves a church. And maybe that's a good thing. So, you know, this is me thinking off the cuff here. But one of the things I've always had a problem with is pastors that leave a church and leave it without a pastor. And I I struggle with that. I mean, I think that's a not a good uh, good for the church. And I'm not sure that that's a good picture of what the shepherd does. I mean, I, if you go back to that illustration of the shepherd, you just can't walk away from the sheep. I mean, that that doesn't happen. The, the sheep have to be cared for. So the shepherd has to make sure they're cared for before he leaves, before he takes another job. 
Well, I, I kind of wonder if that's maybe not a better way for us to look at the role of the pastor. So maybe we should have a pastor as essential for the church, in which case we need to have a different way of dealing with uh, pastoral transition. It, it would mean we cannot have a time without somebody clearly in that role. And there are different ways we might can answer that if we came down in that place. But at the moment, it does not seem... At least operationally, we're not working in that sphere. So uh, I would be happy to hear your thoughts on that. But uh, I, I can't put it in my essential definition, not the way we consider and do things right now. So that's why things like pastor, uh, deacons are not in there. This is the minimal. What do you have to have? And for me, I'm, I look at this definition and I say, yeah, I mean, I, there's not really much in there that you can take out and me say this is uh, going to be a church. Uh, if, a, if a group of people gather and they worship Jesus without being on mission, I really would struggle to call them a church, even if they had a pastor or somebody who called himself a pastor. Because I, I don't know if a pastor could truly say that he's pastoring if he's not helping that church be on the mission of Christ. And I think this is one of our struggles. I think there are churches that exist today that call themselves a church that have pastors and deacons and they function week after week after week. And they're not actually on the mission of Christ. They are uh, doing some things. They're trying to build up the church as far as edification, but they're not equipping members and sending them out. They're not joining Jesus on his mission to get the gospel to the world, this mission of reconciliation. Well, to me... Uh, that's foundational. <laughs> that's kind of what the church exists for. So I, I would struggle more with calling that group a church than a group that didn't have a pastor. Be that as it may, today we're looking at Jesus. Last week, we really considered that we're his followers. I mean, that was and we're, the next word in the definition, basically. So we're looking at group and then followers and then Jesus. So we're following Jesus. And the neat thing is, we had looked at followers and looked at the Merriam-Webster de definition. They gave three different aspects of follower that I thought were all good and, and applicable. Um, as a quick review, one in the service of another, one that follows the opinions or teachings of another, or one that imitates another. And in this case, the another is Jesus. So you go back and put him in each one of those definitions, we would say that a follower is one in the service of Jesus, one that follows the opinions or teachings of Jesus, one that imitates Jesus. And I would say, then we can say that that word follower really means disciple. A disciple is one in the service of Jesus, who follows the teachings of Jesus, who imitates Jesus. And that's really what we mean by a disciple of Jesus. So we go back and look at those verses that we looked at last week, uh, Matthew 28, 18, 19, 20, it says, then Jesus came to them, so we have it right off the bat, and it says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So authority has been given to Jesus. So when we say that uh, we're following Jesus, that he is the center of this definition of the church, he has the authority. So when he says, go and make disciples and teach them, all these things. He says, I, I've commanded you these things. I am the one with all authority, and I'm with you. Jesus is the one that says that he's, he's with us. So again, he's the center of Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20. Uh, we looked at John 14, 23, and Jesus told them, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. He said, if you love me, that relationship's really key. Uh, if you don't love me, you're not going to obey my teaching. That's pretty clear. John 15, 9 to 14, uh, he talks about his relationship with God the Father. The Father's loved me, so I have loved you. And we have to remember when he says, I have loved you, who are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus, the one who has all authority. We've already looked at that. So remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. So he tells us how to remain in his love. You remain in his love by being obedient to his commands. Um, let's go ahead and, and begin to look at, we follow Jesus and we obey Jesus and we teach that we should do that, but why? Today we want to focus on, uh, 
briefly, this is a really a lifetime study. The rest of your life, if you're a follower of Jesus, you should be studying who Jesus is and what Jesus has to say. But if we ask the question, why do I follow Jesus and who is Jesus? That foundational question. Here's a starter list for you, a few things to think about. There is more, obviously. I never go as deep as you could. And part of that is I I would say I'm not as much a theologian as a practitioner. And everyone is a theologian and everyone is supposed to be a practitioner. But if I err, <laughs> my intention is to err toward practicing what I know. Uh, that's my intention. I probably fail in that like I fail in many other things, but that's my goal. So, Quick quote, I love this. Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis, he said in his writing there, I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, him being Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would be either a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that door open to us. He did not intend to. I love that. The, the one thing that is crystal clear about Jesus is that he is a dividing line. And I mean, he is a crystal clear dividing line. You see it uh, even in our calendar. We go back and why is it 2024? Well, we have a dividing line and it's really... Uh, goes back to Jesus. So why did Lewis say all this about Jesus? Why would he say so strongly that you can't just say he was a good teacher? Because if you go through and you <laughs> very, very carefully ignore a lot of what he said, then you could say, well, he did say some, some good moral things. He, he obviously had some good moral teaching. So why could you not just accept the moral aspect of his teaching and kind of ignore the other? Well, I think the, the biggest reason is because if he is God, uh, that trumps everything else. The moral stand that he uh, stood for, the, the moral teaching that he had was based on who he is. Uh, the morality that he taught is based on the reality of God, the reality of man's existence, the, man, the reality of our sin. The Bible claims that Jesus is God. And I'm always kind of amazed that there are people who say, well, no, he didn't, he didn't say that, and the Bible doesn't say that. I, I don't know, maybe I'm just stupid, but I'm just going to look at a handful of verses today. And this is, not, you don't even have to think very hard when you look at these verses, if you just look at what they say, they say Jesus is God. The first one's Isaiah 9, 6. It's looking forward here, right, from the Old Testament, looking to the Messiah who's coming. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I, I don't know. <laughs> that, that looks suspiciously like, if you just take what it says, that this child who is coming, who is the Messiah, is God. It's, I mean, it says mighty God right there. Um, this is the Bible's claim. Jesus is God. The Messiah is God. Um, Hebrews 1.8 and again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. And speaking of the angels, he says he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the Son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. 
a scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. Again, I mean, you can explain away, maybe, <laughs> I can't. I, I look at it and says, oh, it says the Son is God. I mean, that's, it doesn't seem to be any room for, for gray there. That seems black and white to me. I don't know. Uh, Titus 2.13 Starting verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Again, it, it, it continually says the same thing. Here, Paul is writing to Titus, and he says, We're waiting for that blessed hope. What is the hope? The appearing of our great God and Savior. Who is that? That's Jesus. So this is why C.S. Lewis said it. He, the Bible doesn't leave you the option. Jesus didn't leave people the option. He, they tried to stone him because they understood he was saying that he was God. He made himself equal with God. And they tried to stone him. So it's not an option to say that he's just a good moral teacher. Um, you have to accept who he says that he is and who the Bible says that he is. Or why would you accept anything that he says if he thought that he was God? Why would you follow him? That would be insanity. Uh, if he is not God, but he tried to convince people that he was God, then he's evil. So again, that's, that's not a good person. That's not a good moral teacher. So he really only left us one option. Uh, John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Again, I believe this is talking about Jesus. And again, it says very clear, clearly, he is God. So when we think, think about why would we follow Jesus? Why would we follow his commands? Why would we be obedient? Where does his authority come from? You know, we could ask that, and that's not a direction I went today, but we could have gone there. When we look at Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20, and he says, all authority is given to me. Well, all authority uh, pretty much puts him as God. I mean, you have to be God to be able to weld that authority. So we follow Jesus because he is God. We follow Jesus because there are no options other than to be obedient to God. Well, how could you not? If you understand who he is, uh, then you should want to follow him. Now, as we go forward we'll see that, that there are things that develop from that that make it even more important because he could be God and, you know, there are people that believe that God exists, but he's distant from us. He, he doesn't care about us. He has really no relationship to us. He just created things and let them run, and now uh, he leaves us to our own devices. Now, if that were true, then you could kind of ignore why would we follow? Because God doesn't care. He's just doing his own thing. He didn't do it that way. So Jesus is God, but he's also the Savior of the world. Acts 5, um, verse 30 says, The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and Savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Now, I mean, there's a lot in, <laughs> in this passage, and particularly if you go into the, the broader context, but just looking at these verses, Jesus is the Savior. And here specifically, we're looking at the relationship God didn't leave Israel behind. Uh, Israel ultimately um, will achieve salvation in the same way that we do, th 
through uh, repentance and forgiveness. God has always had a remnant from Israel. And Jesus is the crux. Jesus is the center. Jesus is what all of the Old Testament pointed to and all of the New Testament builds upon. He is that foundation. So 1 John 4, um, and we have seen, 1 John 4, 14, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be Savior of the world. Now, uh, this there's lots of ways we could have developed this thought, and we could have gone back and looked at at the gospel and how he did that. And that's really not my intention today, but just the idea that he is the Savior. That's one of the reasons why we follow him. That's one of the reasons why we obey him. Uh, we have the testimony of men like Paul and John, all of the apostles. Uh, over 500 of those early disciples saw him. The record of the early church expansion throughout Acts, that the work that he accomplished on the cross succeeded. God had this plan in eternity past to offer salvation through his son, and he was successful. How do we know that? Because we see the church. We see the change in the world. We see the change in men's lives. Uh, we see the church really is that uh, the ultimate witness to the truth that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious bottle body. So here you have that that same idea. He is the Savior, and because of Him, we have citizenship in heaven. And you also have, kind of what we looked at in Matthew 28, the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control. He is the one with authority. He is the Christ. We await eagerly this Savior, and He is going to transform us to be like Him. That's why we follow Him. Uh, He has promised us this future, we, we have this glorious hope that we mentioned earlier, uh, that we, this, um, we anticipate from Titus 13, this, this blessed hope that Jesus will come back, that we will see Him, see him again, that He will uh, redeem us, and that He is purifying us. That's why we follow Him. We eagerly await, is what Paul writes, We eagerly await a Savior. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await the Savior from there. It is Jesus, and He has the authority to bring everything under His control and to transform us so that we will be like Him. That's why we follow Him. Part of the the progression here, you say that Jesus is God, and as God, He has become Savior and it required, and we're not going to go into it today, we can get into the theology that the sacrifice required God to, to give it. We absolutely know that we couldn't have done it ourselves. There was no alternative way. God was the only one that could, could do this. So Jesus had to be the Savior. And then some of the evidences that He is the Messiah come from the truth that Jesus is a miracle worker. We follow him like many of the people in the the New Testament because of his authority, because of his power that's evidenced in the miracles that he wrought. So healing, you know, Mark 2, uh, 1 to 12, he healed a paralytic. And so this, this is a miracle. He healed someone that medicine couldn't heal. Uh, he He did this in a way that was miraculous. He didn't take out a medicine bag. (laughs) He is God. His authority over this life gave him the ability to do that. That's why we follow him. He he wasn't just able to heal. Uh, He was able to raise people from the dead, Luke 7, 11 to 17. Uh, He raised Lazarus. You know, that's the power over death. So many people today that have any money, they, they're trying to figure out how can they prolong their life. 
Uh, how can they achieve immortality? And on the one hand, as a, as a follower of Jesus, you go, well, you want to achieve immortality and a long life. Well, I mean, God kind of told you how to do that. It is through Jesus you will have immortality and life in a perfect body. Anything you could achieve on this life to prolong your life for a few extra years is not going to prolong it in the way that it will be uh, perfected in eternity in the presence of Jesus. Now, that's one reason why I, you know, I'm not terribly excited about prolonging the slow decay in this life, in this body. I, I look forward to the perfection of eternity. So, Jesus was able to heal this body, but also to to raise people from the dead. And ultimately, and we see that he, he raised from the dead. Well, he didn't just have power over the body. And we see lots of, of examples, Matthew 8, where he uh, healed some with leprosy. Uh, the, the woman in Luke 8, where uh, he healed her, the man born blind in John 9, um, he had power over, uh, what do you call it, this world, over the earth, over the elements. He calmed a storm in Mark 4. Like, wow, that, that is amazing. Uh, we have storm chasers in the Midwest, and they chase storms. Uh, Jesus didn't chase them. He stopped them. <laughs> uh, he was able to control those things. Uh, he fed the multitudes in Matthew 14, and this is a different kind of elemental control, right? Uh, he's not controlling a storm, something that started naturally and he just kind of ended it. He's, it's really a creative miracle, I would say. I don't know, he's uh, making something um, happen that can't happen. <laughs> he said a walk on water, Matthew 14 as well. Uh, you see, again, he has this control over the elements, but not just over physical and the elements, but we see in Matthew 17, he cast out demons. He had control over uh, the spiritual world as well. So why do we follow Jesus? Well, we follow him because who he is. He's God. He is the Savior. He's the miracle worker. He, he exhibits absolute authority. He gives evidence of his absolute authority over things in this life. And we don't have to question, uh, is God able to do what he says? He absolutely is able to do what he says. Uh, he does it uh, time and time again. So we follow Jesus. We obey his commands because he is God. He is the Savior of the world. There are no real options. He has shown us in so many ways that he is who he says that he is and that the natural response is to accept him as he says that he is and to follow him. We'll be back in a minute with a little more on Jesus, the one that we follow. Okay, welcome back. So we've looked at the truth that Jesus is God. We understand that he is the Savior and that he's proved that in many, many ways. We looked at some of the miracles, and there's a lot more we could look at uh, as far as why we follow Jesus. But I'm going to maybe skip ahead a little bit. You know, we, we, follow, we follow him because he is God, Savior, because he's doing something. We go back to this definition of the church. It says the church is a group of followers of Jesus who worship him in spirit and truth, and worship Him because He is God, because He is a Savior, humbly offering their lives as living sacrifices, together living out the mission of Jesus. And we'll eventually, down the road, we'll get to that, get to that one and cover in a little more detail the mission of Jesus. But for now, to understand that one of the reasons we follow Jesus is because He actually has a mission. Uh, he's doing something. And in our definition, we even include some of what our part of that is. It says, we are His witnesses to the world. Well, we do that by sharing the gospel. The gospel is His story. 
we make disciples through teaching obedience to His commands. He actually has commands. He's not a God that is far away. He's a God that is nearby. Uh, he has things for us to do that relate to what He is doing, His mission. So we uh, edify, encourage, build up others, and equip them to join us on His mission. So again, we, we look through this definition and we see Jesus and His mission and His work and His commands spread throughout this. So we follow Jesus because He's God, because He's Savior, because He's doing something. And one of the realities of our existence in the world is that we want our lives to matter. We, we want to feel that like we lived for something. We don't want to waste our lives. One of the cool things is that in addition to the salvation that is offered through Christ, Jesus offers us a part in His mission. He offers us a kind of significance that we cannot achieve on our own. Our lives are never going to matter in the way that they matter when they're attached to His mission uh, in any other way. It doesn't matter what else you pursue. You can be great at any profession. It's always going to be less than the smallest part in His mission. And part of that is because of the eternality of His mission. When you understand God is working on an eternal scale, Jesus and His mission has an eternal impact. Anything else in this life that you work to accomplish, it's, it's temporary. Think of the greatest uh, engineering marvel that you can imagine. All those things eventually are replaced, are deteriorate, are no longer necessary. Maybe they're marvels as far as we're, we think they're cool. Uh, they still work, um, but they begin to deteriorate. And eventually, no matter what it is, it eventually will decay. And <laughs> a million years from now, no one will care. There's a limit to the value of even the greatest achievement in this lifetime. Think of what doctors achieve. A great uh, advances in medicine that have saved you know, thousands and millions of lives. That's wonderful. But it's nothing compared to the eternal salvation that is attached to the mission that Jesus has. There's no greater work that we can give our lives to. So when we consider why do we follow Jesus specifically, Part of it is because of this mission that He has offered us a part in. He has invited us into His life, His mission. And there's nothing better that we can do. We follow Jesus because outside of Him, our lives don't really have a purpose. You know, we're, we're designed for a reason. We're created for a reason. And the only way that we can achieve we can accomplish that purpose, is in Christ. Is as we follow Christ, separated from Him, we, we live a meaningless existence. And you can see um, the fruit of living that meaningless existence as you look at suicide rates and depression rates and how so many people struggle on their own without God, without Jesus. It's very clear that life is pointless without Him. But once you truly understand who He is and what He offers you, then there's not really a choice. You don't have to think very hard about should I follow Jesus when you know who He is, when you understand what He's done, when you understand what He offers. And His disciples understood that really, really clearly, and they made the choice to follow him. And maybe I should step back and say, they didn't always understand that really, really clearly, right? As you go through the Gospels, it's really, it's almost comical looking back <laughs> that they, they just didn't understand. Even when he just said it as clearly and as like, you just, how could he say it more clearly? They didn't understand. And part of that, uh, well, there's many, many reasons for that. We won't get into that today. Some of it's their background and their expectations of the Jews, and some of it's uh, just the Holy Spirit wasn't ready for them to understand it yet. It wasn't time. 
But I want to look at a passage. This is kind of a longer passage. It'll take a little bit to go through this. But I think it points to this, that even in the middle of not understanding and being a little bit confused and maybe even a little afraid, they understand there was no other option. So look at John chapter 6, and we're going to start with verse 41. I'm going to read a pretty long section here. John chapter 6, start at verse 41. It says, At this the Jews there began to grumble about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. In hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, They are full of the Spirit and life, yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Now, this is, this is an amazing passage because clearly the disciples didn't really understand what he's teaching. They, they were confused. But as Simon P- Peter answered for the, the 12, he answered, I think, in a way that we all have to answer. Where else would we go? What are your options? If Jesus is who He says that He is, if He is the Savior of the world, if we have eternal life in Him. You know, the New Testament tells us these things are written that you might have life and that uh, that eternal life 
comes through believing in Him. And they say, we, we have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. So the question for us becomes today, exactly what Jesus asked them. What's your answer? Are you going to follow when the way is difficult? Because, let's be honest, <laughs> the, the way can be very difficult even as part of the church family. So even though, you know, you can look at the New Testament and you can, you can accept what I've been saying today, that yes, there's, there's clear evidence that Jesus is who He says that He is, that He really is God, that He really is the Savior of the world. You can accept that. But even knowing that to be true, you can look at the words that He said. You can look at the challenge that He gave and say, man, that's a hard, that's a hard saying. Think about His challenge to follow Him, to be a disciple, to be a disciple maker. You know, He said, deny yourself. Hey, we can stop right there and go, wait, wait, whoa, <laughs> deny myself what? Well, he's, what do you mean by that? Well, why would I do that? Why should I have to do that? So I, a lot of people that right there, we we're already stuck. Deny myself? Why? I shouldn't have to deny myself. I have these desires. I have this, this will. I want to live. I, I want to do things. Why would I deny myself? Now, that can be difficult. And many people will get to that point and go, no, I, I can't. So they walk away. Like many of those early disciples, they, they walk away. Some people go, well, yeah, I, I can understand some need for self-discipline and sacrifice, so I deny yourself. But then it says, take up your cross. And even when the disciples heard that, in the first time, <laughs> they didn't necessarily know what he meant by it. But when he said, deny yourself and take up your cross, they had a better picture than we do of the difficulty that was probably being indicated. Now, not a clear picture, certainly not a clear picture, but they understood when he's saying, take up your cross. I mean, they have, they have that picture right in front of them. They probably had all seen people dragging their cross down this road. They had seen people on their way to be executed. They understood when he said, take up your cross, this is not, let's have a picnic and then a party to follow. This is something extreme. This is something radical. So when he's saying, deny yourself and take up your cross, I'm not sure what they understood, but they, they couldn't have understood that as something simple and easy. He didn't leave them that option, that he didn't choose words that would give them that picture. Deny yourself and take up your cross. And many people, when they hear that, that he gives them that call to take up your cross, they will say, I, that's too much. Yeah, I've got things I want to do. You know, you're, you're limiting me. <laughs> if, I, if I have to do that, if I have to take up my cross, well, then what about the fun? What about the rest of my life? What about all these other things that I want to accomplish in my life? And they walk away. You have to answer that same question. Do you want to leave too? Jesus asked. What's your answer? Will you follow when the way gets tough? And even within the church, it gets tough. I mean, I, I think the church family is critical. <laughs> I, I Honestly, I don't believe that you can live out obedience to the commands of Jesus outside of His church. You are expected to be a part of a church family. I mean, that's, that's one of the clear 
things. Jesus, in his, in his work, in going to the cross, in offering salvation, part of what he's doing is building this family. These relationships are knit together by the Holy Spirit, which is available because of the gospel, because of what he accomplished. But let's be honest, though, the relationships, even, even among believers, can be painful, often are painful, because even though other believers are on the same path, they have uh, they have accepted Christ as Savior. They're making some kind of stumbling attempts to follow Him. We all do it imperfectly. We all bring our baggage with us. the The thing about the way that salvation and sanctification works, you may be released from the penalty of sin, but you will still carry the consequences of sin in this lifetime. So the baggage from your past sin, maybe even baggage from your family, as your family had sinful relationships and interactions that harmed you and harmed the way that you view other people, the way that you view God, you carry those consequences into the present, into the future, at least for a while. What that means is there are many, many of us who are prone to hurt others. We have learned a certain way of interacting, which is not healthy. And even when we come to Christ, that doesn't change overnight. Can it change? Yes. Should it change? Again, yes. But how does it change? Well, quite often slowly and in that relationship. As we are uh, confronted with our behavior, or as we need to confront other people with their behavior, both, both sides of that are painful. With, to, be, you know, to be sure, you know, I've, I've had to be on both sides of that. I don't, I don't like to be confronted because I've done something wrong, and I don't like to have to confront somebody else. Uh, I don't like to go somewhere and, and talk to someone and realize that, man, they're making poor choices, but this, they, they need someone who, will, who cares for them to talk to them. And you have to care enough to do that, but it's still painful. It's still hard. It's never easy. It's never been easy for me. I don't ever like it. I'd be very, very happy if I never had to have that kind of conversation again from either side. Relationships can be painful, even among believers. Understand that. But part of the way that we change, part of the way that our ebb and flow of relationships change is through this obedience to being part of this relationship. It's part of being very intentional, making serious efforts to obey the commands of Jesus. I think as we do that, as we make those serious efforts, one example of what I mean by that is we look at things like the one another's and we consider how do we do that. I think it's worth doing a study, and I recommend this all the time, Go through the New, New Testament. <clears throat> you can take a concordance. You can go online and look up one another's of the New Testament. You can probably find a list of them. Um, go through and think very carefully about how you live that in the relationships that you have in the church. And one thing you'll find is you have to have a relationship with people to live out most of those. You, you don't do those things with strangers. You, you have to have a relationship with someone to, uh, to bear their burdens. You know, to me, that's, that's one of those that really points out a lot because often we don't actually know that much about each other. So we don't know what our burdens are. You know, if I don't know you that well, then I kind of can excuse myself for not helping you. But what's the problem? Well, if you're part of my church family, the problem is that I don't know you that well. I don't know you well enough to to know what your burdens are, which probably means that I don't love you, which that's one of those one another's to love one another. I don't love you well enough to get to know you well enough to know what your burdens are well enough to help you. And see, they're, they're attached, and they're attached to a relationship. So I I love Jesus. 
Uh, he is God. He is my Savior. And because of that, I follow Him. I obey His commands. He has a lot of commands that have to do with how I interact with other people. And as I'm intentional about evaluating those commands and asking that question of how do I live this out uh, in my neighborhood? How do I live this out in my church? Well, I make different choices. It means sometimes, go back to what I mentioned before, Jesus invited us to deny ourselves. Well, sometimes it means denying myself what I want to do, to do something that I know is going to be a little bit hard, but that's going to put me in a place to get to know people in my church better. So by denying myself the right to a relaxing Saturday afternoon and getting together with the church family to spend relational time so that I do get to know what their burdens are and what they're struggling with, I put myself in a position maybe to live out some of the other one another's, like encourage one another. As I get to know someone better, as I understand what their burdens are, what they're struggling with, what they're uh, doing in life, where God's working in their life, I may realize, and often do, that God's been teaching me things that probably would be an encouragement. And I can share those because I've showed up. (laughs) And really, that's what a lot of the ministry of the church comes down to. You have to show up. The more you show up, the more opportunities you have to be obedient to those commands and live out the one another's. The less you show up, the less likely you are to know people well enough to have the opportunity to live those one another's. And by showing up, I don't mean show up Sunday five minutes before church and leave ten minutes after you showed up for the service. I mean show up for the relationship. Show up as if getting to know this person Getting to know these people in this group was your job, because it is. And what I have always found, I don't know there are any exceptions, that as I've gotten to know people in any kind of uh, church setting, and it's repeated, and I get to know people's quirks and who they are and what they're struggling with, and you see what they're learning and how they're uh, reading and praying, I've had opportunities to share what God's teaching me and things that might be encouraging to them. But probably more often, I've been encouraged. As I've seen people who are struggling with things maybe that I can't imagine, but they're consistently trying to put Jesus first, even in the midst of a difficult situation. That's been encouraging to me. That's been challenging to me and to my faith to show up because I want to be an encouragement and realize I walk away going, wow, I, I needed that. I needed that time. I needed to hear how God's working in this church, how God's working in this family. So if you are showing up and you're making intentional, serious efforts to obey the commands of Jesus as they relate to us as a group, the one and others particularly, I think it will, re- it will result in your spiritual growth and it will re- result in the building up of the church because that interaction of each of us obediently trying to follow Christ ourselves and trying to help each other to do that, uh, I think that there's a special synergy there that happens. We are that body. It does. We're not the body apart, we're the body together. Intentional obedience to the commands of Jesus will connect us directly to Jesus and His mission. He is building His church, and He's building it not just numerically, adding new people to it, but He's building His church up. And He uses us to do that. You know, I, I don't know if you thought about it, but <laughs> I think about it a lot, and I've heard it said in many different ways. It doesn't really, know, it doesn't really matter how much you know about Jesus if you aren't practically engaged in following Jesus. You can know about Him. You can know lots of facts. And I've, I've given you some. Oh, He's God. He's the Savior. Here's a list of miracles that He's done. That, those are truths. Those are facts about Jesus. But if we're not practically engaged in living out what He said to do, then we really don't have much to do with Jesus. So ultimately, I've asked this question several shows in a row at the end, 
The question is, how do we live this out here now? You live in a context, you live in a place, you have people around you. How do you live this out? How do you follow Jesus? How do you follow Jesus where you are? I think our goal is a life that is intentional, relational, and centered on Jesus. And what we're struggling with, what I'm struggling with as I think about this definition of the church, is what does that look like? How do we take that and instill it into a small group of people in, in a way that it is, um, it resounds in a way that it grows and develops into a vibrant, alive church that is on the mission of Christ? That's the question. And I think we're in this together. <laughs> I think that it is our mission as the church. So I want to thank you for joining me again today. I've said this a couple of times in a row, I think, but stop and say a prayer for your church family today. They definitely need it. I'd love to hear from you. You can write me at norman at runwithhorses.net. You can leave a comment on the Run With Horses podcast Facebook page, which I do check, but I, I don't write as much on there as I probably should. But I would write more if you left me a note on there. So it's probably your fault that I don't use my Facebook page that much. So I'm going to blame it on you. So send me a note and tell me why it's not your fault. Uh, Take time to pause and thank God for His work in your life. And whatever you do, keep running.